Every day, new discoveries and expeditions, technological advancements, and significant scientific breakthroughs take place. In this video, we will be discussing about some huge discoveries that the government is trying to conceal. Vought Aircraft's lead engineer, Rex Beazel, spearheaded the development of the F-4U Corsair, which started in early 1938. Vought had built a prototype by May 1940. The new warrior's inverted gulf flaps gave it an instantly recognized visage when viewed from the front, and they were meant to provide ground clearance for the enormous 13-foot propeller. The Corsair set a new speed record for a single-seat fighter aircraft on its maiden flight, topping 400 miles per hour in level flight. The Navy was so impressed with the fast fighter that it instructed Vought to start manufacturing. By the end of the F-4U's manufacturing run in 1952, about 13,000 units had been produced. In 1943, the F-4U Corsair entered the battle giving Allied naval aviators an advantage over their adversaries. The Corsair succeeded as a fighter and an assault aircraft with the assistance of ground forces, thanks to its speed, toughness, and weaponry. The F-4U-4 was the last Corsair version to see duty during World War II, thanks to its more powerful engine. In 1943, due to a desperate need for fighter units in the Solomon Islands, the Marine Fighting Squadron was improvised in theater, using replacement pilots from other squadrons. During the squadron's two six-week tours on duty, Major Gregory Pappy Boyington's self-proclaimed Black Sheep gunned down 97 Japanese planes and destroyed another 103, making the Black Sheep one of the best-scoring aviation units in the South Pacific. VMF 214's Corsairs were rarely handled by the same pilot every day. Pappy would in fact always fly the aircraft in the worst situation possible on every tour so that a pilot under his control wouldn't have to. This plane is dressed in one of the squadron's known aircraft markings. The ruins of an ancient Roman city three times the size of Pompeii are underneath the Tyrrhenian Sea off the coast of Naples, where Rome's super-duper elite would gather on weekends to party and engage in illicit relationships. Despite its historical significance, very few have heard of Baiae and it remains one of the Roman Empire's least studied, most exciting locations yet. Baiae, which is submerged in the Bay of Naples, was the site of opulent villas with warm spas, elaborate water characteristics, intricate mosaic tile pools, even a nymphaeum, and a cave of delight encircled by marble statues influenced by Greek art, where potent Roman politicians could partake their wildest wishes. While some of the city ruins are still visible on land, most are submerged due to volcanic behavior that has eroded the coast throughout time. Nevertheless, archaeologists discovered a road network, kilometers of brick walls, and homes with beautiful marble floors and magnificent mosaics. One of the villas found was so opulent that archaeologists assume it was the imperial villa, built especially for Emperor Claudius. So far, no prominent public areas such as a forum, church, or marketplace have been discovered. Fortunately, local photographer and diver Antonio Busiello, who lives in nearby Naples, was asked to capture the excavated underwater metropolis to see it up close. When Busiello was a curious adolescent, he found Baiae, which was then unguarded. Many divers swarm off with ancient amphora and other relics, but now it's a different situation. The Italian government restricted commercial boat tours to the archaeological area in 2000 2 and limited the number of dives that could be done. As per the oceanographer who discovered the historic ocean liner, the Titanic was discovered in 1985 due to a secret U.S. Navy probe of two destroyed nuclear submarines. The Titanic's explorer, Robert Ballard, claimed that while elements of this Cold War saga have been recognized since the mid-1990s, more comprehensive information is finally coming to light. In 1982, Ballard contacted the Navy to request funds to develop the robotic submersible equipment he needed to locate the Titanic. The military was interested in the technology, but only for the sake of inspecting the wreckage, according to Ronald Thunman, then the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Submarine Warfare. Ballard volunteered to assist since his equipment could reach the submerged submarines and take photographs. He made it clear that the project's goal was to investigate the sunken warships. If there was still time after Ballard accomplished his quest, Ballard could do whatever he wanted, according to Thunman. Still, he never gave him express authorization to hunt for the Titanic. The Thresher and Scorpion had plummeted to 10,000 to 15,000 feet in the North Atlantic Ocean. According to Ballard, the Army wanted to know what happened to the nuclear reactors that fueled the ships. The Navy was also interested in seeing if there was any confirmation that the Soviets had taken down the Scorpion. As per Thunman, 
Ballard statistics revealed that the nuclear reactors were secure on the ocean floor and had no effect on the environment. According to Thunman, a catastrophic incident caused the submarine's forward end to leak. As a result, a debris trail is formed based on the physics of the currents. Ballard went looking for the Titanic with only 12 days left on his quest. Using this knowledge to hunt down the ocean liner, he theorized that the ship had sunk in half leaving a debris trail behind it. Since then, the researcher has employed a similar method to locate other buried ships and valuables, notably on his Black Sea missions. A nine-foot-tall bronze sculpture of Christ was placed into 25 feet of water off the shore of Key Largo, Florida, on August 25, 1965. This sunken statue in John Pennekamp State Park, called the Christ of the Abyss, was the third of its kind produced from the original Italian casting. On August 22, 1954, right off the coast of San Fruto Oso, on the Italian Riviera, the Christ of the Abyss was plunged into the Mediterranean Sea. Guido Galetti created the bronze statue, which was based on an idea by Italian diver Duilio Marcante. It was intended to represent Christ in the modern paradigm beneath the waves and a monument for those who had died at sea and a memorial to those who persisted to dig beneath it. A second bronze sculpture was created from the same mold seven years later. It was sunk off the coast of St. George's Grenada in the Southern Caribbean Sea, just like the original. Finally, on October 22, 1961, it was installed as a contribution from Italy in honor of the Italian crew. On August 25, 1965, a third incarnation was sunk, this one cast from the first mold. This time, the underwater setting was near dry rocks in Key Largo's John Pennekamp Coral Reef State Park. Egidio Cressi, an Italian dive equipment maker, donated the monument to the Underwater Society of America. After much debate, John Pennekamp Park was selected as the statue's final resting location. Location. It came in 1965, but had to wait for a massive concrete base to be built first. The larger-than-life bronze statue was ultimately lowered to the ground on August 25th, with the entire ensemble standing in 25 feet of water. It quickly became one of Key Largo's most notable underwater features, attracting many divers. Snorkelers can see the top of the statue, which is around 8 to 10 feet below the surface. Much of the ancient world has been buried by disposition or destroyed by people. The missing bits of ancient history that we need to to complete the riddle of our development as humans can be found behind the walls developed by previous civilizations. Many people believe that old tales are simply fables to the phrase, history is a secret. However, we can unearth ancient artifacts that reveal such narratives are not legends from time to time. The ancient city of Thonis Heracleon was thought to be little more than a fable until archaeologist Frank Gordio and his crew, who had been hunting for it since 1996, found its ruins. In 2000, the lost city of Heracleon Leon, which was formerly Egypt's largest harbor, was located underwater after more than 2,000 years. Its origins date back to the 12th century BC, and it has strong ties to ancient Greece. It was only a rumor at the time. The city of Thonis Heracleon was buried deep beneath the water for thousands of years, only emerging in a few rare inscriptions and ancient literature. After years of research, French archaeologist Frank Gaudio and his crew discovered a giant face emerging from the watery shadows of Abu Kir Bay, off the coast of Egypt. Thonis Heracleon, fully buried 6.5 kilometers off the coast of Alexandria, had finally been discovered by Gaudio. 64 ships, 700 anchors, a rich source of gold coins, 16-foot-tall statues, and most significantly, the remains of a gigantic shrine to the god Amun Gareb and the small sarcophagi for the creatures brought there as gifts were among the underwater ruins. The granite and diorite ruins and artifacts are surprisingly well-maintained, providing a peek into what was one of the world's greatest port cities 2,300 years ago. All traffic into Egypt was controlled by the harbor of Thonis Heracleon, the Egyptian and Greek names for the city. The town was crisscrossed with a system of canals, a kind of ancient Egyptian Venice, and its islands were home to modest sanctuaries and houses built around its magnificent temple. Once a thriving metropolis, its past has been largely forgotten, and no one knows how it came to be completely submerged. That's all there is for today. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Please leave us with your valuable feedback if you found the video interesting. Stay tuned till the next video, and until then, see you soon.